Every time I wake up, wanna go back to sleep. Tired of being woke, it may be better to dream. Future and my past feel them rip at the seam. The fabric of my world, what a reality. I don't know what I really know, but I wanna know what I wanna really know now. Yeah. Gotta show me how, gotta show me how, how to live a better way. Thinking, what can I do? Maybe you, maybe you know better. Maybe you, maybe you know better. All right, welcome back, everyone. So we are going back into our series of Know Better. Um, we are at the tail end of this series. Um, no Better has been a series on knowledge. It's been a series on truth. It's been a series about how to know better. Um, so the first week we talked about how Jesus is the truth. Um, Jesus said in the beginning, um, I am the word. Well, this was John 1.1. He said in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Um, and so Jesus also said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So with those two things we talked about in the first week, that Jesus is truth um, and the Bible is Jesus. So we can trust scripture. This is known in the church as sola scriptura. It's a whole thing. Um, for those of you who are like, I don't get that, um, you probably missed the week we talked about it. Um, I, can, I can point you to that message uh, that you can review it if you want, or just talk to me. Um, next week, we talked about truth is not whatever authority says. Um, truth is sometimes confused with passion and popularity. Um, so uh, the big point of that was uh, if you believe something merely because your pastor told you so, that's a bad reason to believe it. Um, truth is not authority. Truth is not passion. Truth is not popularity. Truth is truth. Um, so uh, if you're relying on someone else to tell you what truth is, um, you're in a bad place. Uh, you, need to, you need to find truth. Okay, that's why we're having a series on truth. Um, so, and, in, and even there I talked about, yeah, listen, I'm here telling you about truth. So my biggest encouragement to you guys is go study truth. Um, so... Um, uh, after that, uh, next week we talked about how Jesus was crucified, um, and Jesus died and Jesus rose from the dead. Um, and so we covered the facts of the cross. So Christians say that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is the best historically documented case in all of history. Um, that's not just from biblical texts, that is from actual history and archaeology. So what we did last week is we actually went to outside of the Bible sources. We, uh, we went to uh, a medical journal. Uh, we went to a Jewish historian named Josephus. We went to the enemies of Christianity, people who specifically want to disprove Christianity. Um, and we found their sources to back up that truth. Um, there are things that even people who do not want the fact that Jesus died and rose again to be true, um, they, there are historical accounts where they had to say, yes, this is a thing. Um, so that was fun. Uh, this week, um, we want to talk about something interesting. Um, there's a movement going out there called uh, what's known as the seeker movement. It's very interesting. Um, it's the idea of what if you took like what you wanted from scripture, like the love, the peace, and all that kind of stuff, and then you just kind of threw Jesus out of it. Um, and we talked about this a few weeks ago when we were talking about knowing the right Jesus. Um, different people believe in Jesus was different people. Um, and so finding the right Jesus and the true Jesus. So we want to dive in back into that a little bit more through this lens of truth and knowing better. Uh, before we get into it, uh, as I said, I'm a little off my game today, so we're going to pray for me, uh, and then we're going to pray for you guys as well. So thank you, God, for tonight, Lord. Thank you for bringing us here to your church. Thank you, God, that you brought us here for a reason, God. You, you aligned the cosmos. You have a divine plan, and for some reason, you sat us here tonight. Um, God, I pray that you do not waste your time because we know you don't, Lord. We pray that you don't waste our time, God. We pray that you open up our hearts, our minds, and our souls to listen and to hear what you have for us to hear, God. Um, Lord, don't let me get up here on stage and just preach what I want to preach. Lord, take me out of it, God. Um, we want to know your truth. We want to know what you have to say. So God, help us leave this place challenged, inspired, and encouraged to dive into your word and to make our faith our own and to know the truth, the truth not a made-up thing, not a fantasy that we want to believe, but the real truth. Thank you, God, for all of these things. In Jesus' name, we all said amen. Amen, for those of you who don't know, just simply means we agree with what was just said. Um, okay, so 
as we talked about, we have this thing called the seeker movement. Um, there's big churches, mega churches that are rising now. And the, the goal of these churches is to make Christianity more palatable. You see, we have some things in our church history that are a little awkward for people. Um, we have some things that, that like are hard because they actually require some sort of commitment. And get this, it's kind of crazy, self-control. Uh, so... Um, I, I was listening to a podcast the other day, and this guy, uh, Joe Rogan, was talking to Ben Shapiro, and he was talking about, he was talking about his uh, Jewish religion, right? This is Old Testament stuff. Um, but he was like, why would you want that? And he's like, just because you don't want something doesn't mean it's not true. Like, right? Like, you can't just be like, oh, like, that's inconvenient for me, so I'm going to ignore it, right? Like, I wish I could fly like Superman, I don't think I'm alone here. Um, but I can't just be like, oh, then gravity is inconvenient for me, so why believe gravity? Truth is truth. So it was a really cool thing. But yeah, the seeker movement, they want to take all this stuff, like the, the hard stuff in Christianity, they want to throw it out, and they just want to like preach like, like, you're awesome, and Jesus loves you. Like, it's not wrong. Like, there, we have precedence in the Bible that you were created in the image of God, as we talked about back in February, um, and how much value and how much worth you have, right? Um, but that is, with that value, with that worth, with that design God has given us, comes the statement of, okay, if you don't live up to that design, right, if God created you in his image, if he designed you with all these wonderful inherent abilities and things, right, if you don't live up to that design, that would be a bad thing. So they want to take, like, that kind of stuff and throw it out. Like, ooh, like, that's awkward. Let's just say that we're all awesome all the time because that's fun. Um, I was going out, and uh, I read an article that was really interesting. It was called Christianity is Dying and Spirituality is Thriving. And it was by a guy named Dr. Steve. Um, I can't remember his last name. I think it was McGrugal because that's fun to say. Um, but Dr. Steve wrote this interesting article, and on this article, he, he had five points. He had five points, and I was like, I'll bite. What you got for me, Dr. Steve? And he was like, Christian theology is outdated and insane. Innocent blood for penance? Uh, he said, the Bible is not a source for truth and morality, but a book for good ideas and inspiration. Uh, he said, the enemy of Christianity is not the world. The enemy of Christianity is the church. Um, he said, God is not a Christian. He said, other religions can teach us many things, and that God would adhere to many religions. Um, interesting. And then he said, heaven is not, according to scripture, he said, the Bible doesn't teach that heaven's a real place. He said, the scriptural idea of true heaven is this world where everyone gets along. I wonder how he got the doctor in front of his name. Uh, we're going to dive into that a little bit. Um, but I have a biblical character that I want to look at tonight. I have a biblical text I want to look at tonight. Um, and this character doesn't have a name. Um, but I, I think I found his name. I think his name is Dr. Steve. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. Um, so Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Very short passage today. Um, Jesus is telling a parable. Um, Jesus loved to teach in parables. Um, and the idea is that when he would give us a story, that there was so much weight and gravity to his story that there was something behind it. A lot of times people would say, Jesus, and they would ask for a straight answer. Jesus, what is this? And he'd be like, the kingdom of heaven is like, and he would just tell the story. Um, this is one of those. And uh, we're going to dive into this parable Jesus taught today. Uh, so he also said, this is Jesus speaking. A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he had squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck in that country, uh, struck that country, and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. 
I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fatted calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast, because the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So this is the story of the prodigal son. Um, what's interesting is Steve and this, uh, Dr. Steve um, and the secret movement have a lot in common with the prodigal son when we look at this. Now, there's some cultural things that might go over our heads, right? Um, Jesus was telling the story to Jewish people in a Jewish culture who understood Jewish things. Right? So there's a few things here. If a son tells his father, like, hey, I want my inheritance, can you guys do that to your parents? Can you walk up to your parents and be like, father, I demand my inheritance. Um, so we don't really know what that means. Like, what's, what's the weight with that, right? Um, really what he's telling his father is he's saying, dad, I want my part of your will. I wish you were dead. Like, literally, walking up to his dad, he's like, I wish you were dead. Uh, you have a will? I saw what you wrote in the will. Um, I want what you're going to give me when you're dead, because I just wish you were dead. Um, historically, um, this thing, uh, there's, a, there's an account of a guy who went and, like, researched, like, Jewish history to see if people, if this was a thing. Um, people who did this to their fathers um, literally got beat to death. Like, the, the dad was like, you, you dare? Tell me to my face that you wish I was dead. And they just, like, start beating the kid until he ran, right? Because he just told his dad, like, I want your stuff. I wish you were dead. Give me your stuff right? That doesn't go over too well, um, not even in this American society we have here. Um, there was one account uh, historically of a, a Jewish man whose son said this to him. He gave him his estate, and the father literally died of a broken heart um, because he was so hurt that his son was like, hey, dad, I don't respect you in the least bit, um, but I want your stuff. And the dad, like, he did it, and then he, like, literally lost the will to live. Uh, that's a Star Wars thing. But, um, so what's interesting is um, then it says he took the estate. What he would have gotten was land, and he sold the land quickly. So he, he got the estate, um, which he usually got like a, a piece of land um, is what he would have gotten. And he sold that land um, really quickly, probably not for a, good pr like for a good price, right? Like if I want to sell my house like, and I want to sell it quickly, I don't really have a right to bargain, right? If I want to sell my house in a day, then it better be a steal, right? Because otherwise people are like, ooh, let me think about this. Hmm, let me mull this over. You know, they want to think about it for a while. He like sold his land probably for next to nothing. Um, and he had to get out of, out of town quick because the Jewish community is a very big family community. So if it got around that, you know, Jim Bob like told his father he wished he was dead and was trying to sell his father's land, who would buy that land? The community would be like, forget this kid. Like, wow, we're not, I want no part of that. And so he had to do it quick. He had to do it rapidly. He had to get out of town quick. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things there. Uh, we'll break down more of this later. Um, but I didn't want you guys to lose that. When you hear like a kid's like, hey, I want some cool stuff. And it's like, the kid got cool stuff. Um, you know, it's like we don't understand what that means. So I had to make sure you guys got that. Now, what's interesting is Dr. Steve. You see, Dr. Steve has read the Bible. Dr. Steve has, has gotten into Scripture a little bit. In his article, he references certain Scriptures. They're way out of context. They're completely used wrong. But it shows that he's at least, like, flipped open a Bible. Um, and so he knows, and, and his thing is he's not saying that he's an atheist. He's saying he believes in God. But he has different beliefs in God. Um, and he, he would say, like, the God of the Bible is, is what he's believing in. But he wants to say that the God of the Bible is different. What's interesting about Dr. Steve is, like the prodigal son, he knows the father. He just wishes that father was dead. Like, he wants nothing to do with the God of the Bible. He wants, he wants the cool stuff from Christianity. He wants the cool stuff from the Bible, like all that, like, encouragement, all the, like, wisdom literature. He's like, yeah, that's cool. He's like, but he wants nothing to do with the real God of the Bible, the real father he wants nothing to do with. He wishes he was dead. Um, so God, the God of the Bible, is dead to him. He doesn't want the rules. He doesn't, uh, and what's interesting is love, true love, sacrificial love, the love that Jesus had that we just talked about last week meant nothing to him. He doesn't even want the love 
of this father, the love of this Jesus. Um, he doesn't want the guidance. He only wants the stuff. He should know better. So we're going to go through his points. Let's take a look at this. So his first point, let's break these down. Christian theology is outdated and insane. Innocent blood for penance. So what he's doing is he's looking back at the Jewish customs. He's saying, oh, they used to like sacrifice lambs, right? He doesn't even go to that. He's just like, oh, it's barbaric. They were like, the, like blood for sacrifices? Gross. Like that's not a thing. Um, here's his exact quote. He says, it needs to be rewritten. Scripture. He's saying scripture needs to be rewritten. For decades now, the church has sought to survive on a doctrine of salvation that depended on the shedding of innocent blood to appease an obsessively angry God so as to rescue humanity from what would otherwise result in their conscious and eternal torment in hell. It's crazy theology. It's not what Jesus taught. And as a consequence, it is more pagan than it is Christian. Dr. Steve, I want to throw up from reading that. But um, so... I'm going to tone it back. I'm going to tone it back a little bit. But man, that bugs me. So um, his assumption here is that God wants you to shed your blood to appease him. God is this angry person who is obsessively angry. And if you don't shed your blood for him, you're going to burn in hell. Okay? That's, that's what Dr. Steve is saying is what it says in the Bible. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've read the Bible more than once. Um, and what we just talked about last week is, um, Dean, did you die on a cross? Did, you, did we nail you to the cross on Easter? No, I don't think that happened. Uh, was I nailed to the cross? No. But, but my sins are forgiven according to my religion. Are your sins forgiven, Dean? I, I, so what's going on is the innocent blood that is shed is God's blood. This obsessively angry God who apparently wants you to burn in hell um, actually came down himself and gave his blood so you could be innocent. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I think Dr. Steve is a little off on his theology there. Um, the innocent blood that was shed was Jesus. We just talked about this last week with, with Jesus on the cross. The whole point of the incarnation, the whole point of the crucifixion was that we have sinned. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have sin in our lives. Um, all of us, by our own account, we love to lie. We covet what's not our own. We have lust issues. We have, uh, we, we, we have all of these problems, right, that we have. And Christianity is di distinct among other religions because we're not going to go to you and say, hey, you're a terrible person and you should feel terrible. No. Like, the difference is that we tell you, like, you should get that under control. Like, you should try not to do that. But in truth, those sins are forgiven. Do you have to go sacrifice a lamb? No. The lamb was Jesus. He died for you. As we spat on him, as we murdered him, as we nailed him to a cross, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, that is the innocent blood that Dr. Steve has such a problem with. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I can't think of any religion, any god that someone made up, even the, the funny kid who, who brought up the flying spaghetti monster, that's the thing. Um, he said, I can make up a god, my god's the flying spaghetti monster, right? Like, no other god and no other religion, not even made up fantasy religions, did the god come down and kill himself for his people. You can't write better stuff. So, the prodigal son rejects what the father has built, he wants the good stuff. He cares nothing about the father's sacrifice. Here's the thing. The father that worked up that estate, the father that tended that field, the father that grew that stuff, the father that like, worked and tilled and, and protected and cared and raised his son, the prodigal son wants nothing to do with that. The prodigal son wants the stuff. He doesn't care about the sacrifice. Oh, thank you, dad, for raising me. Oh, thank you, dad, for, for working hard on this stuff. No, thank you. Um, I, just, I just need the money, okay? Thanks, pops. Point number two, the Bible is not a source for truth and morality. You can see how that kind of goes against what we've been talking about. Um, but a book for good ideas and inspiration. Here's his exact quote. They revere the Bible without making a God of it. He's saying true Christians, true Christians, the seeker Christians, right? The book, he says, these people, they revere the Bible without making a God of it. Interpret the Bible for what it is. It's an inspired book capable of providing inspiration, wisdom, and spiritual direction. It's not a textbook on science or morality or answer book preachers might use. Dr. Steve. So the assumption is that the book, the Bible is just a book of wise sayings. Um, he says, don't take it out of context. Interesting. Uh, he says it's not a science book. It's not a book on morality, which is... Very strange that he would say a religious text of the Bible. Even the Bible, even people who don't read the Bible, to say that the Bible is not a book of morality, do you think that person has ever seen a Bible? 
to even say, even people who hate Christianity, right, who don't believe in it, they would not tell you that the Bible is not a book of morality. The Bible teaches morality. So anyways, he's way off. Uh, here's the reality. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And with the word, everything that was made was made. That's John 1.1 1, 1 and John 1.2. Does that sound like the Bible doesn't want to be taken as a God? Like literally, sola scriptura, this idea that scripture is the ultimate authority um, in our lives, like more than a human, we have to turn to scripture as the word of God. John 1.1, 1, 1, right there, tells you it should be treated as God, as Jesus. Um, here's an interesting thing. The Bible was written in three languages over seven different continents by 40 authors over 1,500 years with one consistent message from beginning to end, written by God, self-affirming, and has no contradictions. What? Let's say that one more time. Uh, the Bible was written in three languages over seven continents by 40 different authors over... 1,500 years with one consistent message from beginning to end, written by God, self-affirming, and has no contradictions. We've, go, we've gone over this time and again. Um, this book is a history book. This book proves archaeology. This book is backed up by math, by science, by philosophy. This book is backed up by all of these things that Dr. Steve has a problem with. But here's the thing. The prodigal son, he doesn't care about the father's wisdom. His father is a relic of his past life. He took his money and is ready to live his own way. He'll only remember the father for his stuff when he's in need. You see, Dr. Steve and these Christians and the prodigal son, what they've done, as they said, we don't care about the history of the Bible. We don't care about the God of the Bible. We don't care about the laws, the rules, the archaeology, anything. We don't care about that. Um, we're going to take just the feel-good stuff, right? Whatever it profits us, whatever like wisdom and good inspiration we can get, we're going to throw everything else out. Just like that prodigal son, he took the stuff from the father, but he didn't care about the father's wisdom. That father could have told him what to do with the land. He could have told him how to invest. He could have told him how to manage people. He could have taught him how to set up a good life. He didn't care. In fact, it was only when he was suffering, when everything had fallen down, that he remembered his father and said, I need to go back to my father because he, he has more stuff. So he says, Dr. Steve, the enemy is not the world, it's the church. This is his quote. The real enemy is the church itself. Furthermore, these have given up the church's war with science and psychology, choosing instead to embrace the truth science teaches us, not only about the origins of the universe, but about the complexities of the human mind, human development, and sexuality. Dr. Steve, that's his quote. So he says the real Christians, the, the new age Christians, the seeker Christians, what they've done is they've evolved beyond your traditional understanding of the Bible. They've uh, evolved beyond the, the teachings of the church. Um, they embrace what truth science teaches us, not only about the origins of the universe, but about its complexities of the human mind, human development, and sexuality. So the assumption is that um, the church has no truth about reality. That they need to stay in their lane, right? You're like people like me who teach the Bible, like I have no right to tell you about philosophy. I have no right to tell you about sexuality. I have no right to teach you about history. I have no right to teach you about any of these things. I should stay in my lane and simply just give you guys like feel good messages, right? You should come in depressed and leave encouraged. That's, that's my lot in life. Like that's as far as I should go. Um, here's the reality. Science teaches its own religion based on theories that are blasphemy to their own scientific method, which the church begs them to use. Science and philosophy back up the Christian worldview better than evolution and Darwinian psychology, also known as evolutionary psychology. Here's the deal. When it comes to, when it comes to evolution, right, when it comes to the teachings of science and evolutionary psychology, those kind of things, actually, the teachings of Scripture are more in line with the scientific method than sciences. They will tell you, bold-faced, if you ask them pointedly, any scientist who's worth his salt, are you following the scientific method? The scientific method in and of itself cannot prove Darwinian psychology. In fact, it disproves it. The scientific method within itself disproves evolution. I, I talk about this too much. But the prodigal son believes that once he robs his father of all of his stuff, he has nothing left of value. So let's take a time out real quick. Can I talk about evolutionary psychology? Has anyone here heard about evolutionary psychology? It's exciting. What I love about evolutionary psychology is that if you believe in evolution, here's what I want everyone to do. This is what I wish everyone would do. And this is what people don't do. You come up with a theory, right? The multiverse, evolution, whatever it is, whatever you want to believe in, right? Um, you, you come up with a theory. 
what evolutionary psychology is, and what I really love evolutionary psychology for, not that I believe it because it's crazy, but um, is that it pushes, it pushes the evolutionary discussion further. If you believe in evolution, it says, then let's live a society that understands evolution. Okay? So um, here is evolutionary psychology. Now, real quick, evolutionary psychology is a theoretical approach to psychology that attempts to explain useful mental and psychological traits, such as memory, perception, or language, as adaptations, uh, as the functional products of natural selection. So you've probably heard people say this, right? I hear it like YouTubers say it a lot because they don't have to be smart. Um, but they'll be like, this goes back to when we were monkeys, right? They'll say like, like this goes back to when we were like hunting, gathering, and like, you know, we'd go slay a dinosaur and bring it back home and eat it or whatever the case may be. Like people will say this, right? Um, they, they say it to sound smart, but there's like no proof whatsoever. And a lot of times, I, it's funny because I was listening to two atheists argue with each other over the uh, um, transgender people participating in sports, like when it comes to like the, the men who are participating in women's sports and demolishing all the records. Uh, the, there was a guy who said he was a girl who participated in a UFC match and with like two punches hospitalized like two women. Um, because why? Because there is a biological difference between men and women. And so uh, these two atheists, people who do not believe the Bible, they're arguing with one another. And one guy's coming from the standpoint of evolutionary psychology. And he's talking about how like, no, like, this is just adaptation, and, like, this is okay. And the other guy's like, this is not okay. Like, these people don't, like, they don't meet the metrics. They're blowing out the records. They're hospitalizing people. Can we talk about that? And so if a worldview is to have any value, it must adequately describe the world in view. Let's just talk about that. Everyone here has a worldview, right? Right or wrong, whatever, like, believe what you believe. But all of us have a worldview. Whether you want one or not, you have a view in which you view the world. What I'm calling you to do is to evaluate your worldview, okay? If you have a worldview, if that worldview is good, then it must adequately describe the world in which you live, okay? So if I believe, like, again, gravity is the easy one. It's just fun to use. Everyone does it. I should come up with smarter arguments. But the idea is, like, if I have a worldview that gravity is not real, that doesn't match reality. I very quickly find out gravity is real, right? Okay, so... Um, any worldview that's worth its value, that has any value, needs to adequately describe the world in which we live. If someone presents a worldview that is not in line with reality, then it's a bad worldview. Why? Because it doesn't view the world correctly. I mean, that's simple. Simple, right? So evolutionary psychology simply states that your mind is a product of evolution, and its wants, desires, and impulses are born of reacting to stimuli. There is therefore no moralistic right and wrong, simply a matter of survival and evolution. If you get into Darwinian psychologists, is what they like to call themselves sometimes, if you press them on issues, they believe in some messed up stuff. Why? Because if you believe in natural selection, if you believe in evolution, then the evolution of our species should be the highest good. Right? If we're going to progress as a species, then we should do everything it takes to continue the evolutionary work to become better people. So, like, the whole, like, superior alpha race from, like, the Germans and, like, the Nazis... Guess where that comes from? Okay, so it's like, oh, we found inferior people. We should burn them. Like, okay, so Joseph Stalin was studying to become a priest when his friend showed him the writings of Darwin. Uh, he, said, he said, Joseph, he said, you're studying the Bible. You're, you're stu he's studying to become a priest. This is Joseph Stalin, one of the worst evil dictators of all time. And uh, he's studying to become a priest. And this guy says, wait, wait, wait. There's these writings that have come out. Darwin. He says, you need to read Darwin. It shows you that the world is not what we really think the world is. So Joseph Stalin read uh, Darwinian, or, or Darwinian texts. Um, Stalin went on to murder countless people for a better Russia. Like, murdered them. Uh, was he wrong? Was he wrong to be a dictator? Was he wrong to murder people? Well, here's what an evolutionary psychologist would tell you. Here's what, here's what Darwinian sociology would say. No. He made Russia stronger. In fact, to this day, and this is true, to this day in Russia, Stalin is heralded as a successful leader who helped make Russia a world power and ushered in an, area, an era of nuclear power. This madman, equivalent to almost Hitler-level dictatorship, is heralded as a good person because he took Russia from like kind of an okay place to being one of the leading world powers. He gave them nuclear power. There's a reason why to this day, like we had a cold war and all that kind of stuff. We're worried about Russia. Why? 
because of Joseph Stalin. So evolutionary psychology would say, no, all of this evil, horrible stuff, it doesn't have that in its worldview. Evil morality, what is this? We don't understand. That's not a stimuli we can react to. Um, does, it, does it push forward the evolutionary um, survival of our species? Yes, then it must be good. Um, it's funny because every time I have an argument with someone when we get to this, um, I ask them, I say, uh, do you believe in this stuff? They say, absolutely. I was like, okay, um, I'm bigger and stronger than you, so let's say I punch you and take everything you own. Like, that's not right. Huh? It's not. All right, so <laughs> um, uh, let's move on. Uh, number four, God is not a Christian. Other religions can teach us many things. They have so this is Dr. Steve again. They have exchanged the insanity of the dying church that insists we're right, you're wrong, for the sane, we, we're in, and you are too, approach. So he's saying that they, the church has abandoned its stance of we're right, you're wrong, right? That when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life, no one comes to the Father except through me, he's not denying that the Bible says that, but he says what Jesus really meant was I'm a way, a truth, and a life, Everybody comes to the Father, including me. Um, and so he said, uh, he said, we're in and you are too, approach to human and religious solidarity. Together, these Christians seek spiritual awareness, spiritual enlightenment, and they seek the good of all people too, even those who embrace no religion. So the assumption is that the church wants to condemn people for being free thinkers, right? Um, we want to condemn people for being free thinkers. It's funny because I went and saw the movie um, Smallfoot, which is a great movie. I loved it, actually. And it was kind of like anti-religion. They were like, they were like, you have questions? Push them down. Like, like, don't ask questions. And what I thought was funny is I, I loved that movie, actually, because it described, like, every religion. Don't ask questions. If you have questions, push them down. That's the uniqueness of Christianity is that movie was kind of against every religion. They probably didn't know it. It was against every religion except for Christianity. That is the beauty of Christianity. You have questions? What are they? Let's ask them. Let's go over them. We're not afraid. Other religions? Ooh, just have faith. Don't doubt. Right? We're going to talk about faith in a few weeks and, and what the role of faith is. But the idea of faith, a misapplication of faith is to say, oh, do you have doubts and struggles? Mm, just have faith. Just, just believe and just push away those troublesome questions. That's not what we're here to do. So the next one goes along with this, uh, number five. He says, heaven isn't a real place. True heaven is this world where everyone gets along. Uh, here's this quote. No, these Christians would view hope the way Jesus, their leader, viewed it, the way the prophets of old viewed it, the way the entire biblical narrative views it, as a vision of the world wherein peace and justice and plenty for everyone exists in the here and now, a world where all people are treated equally, cared for, respected, fed, and nurtured for the wonderful creations of God that they are, a world where all people, regardless of color, sex, race, religion, political party, nationality, or sexual orientation, have a voice and a place. Dr. Steve. Um, somebody get that man a flower crown. Um, so um, what he's saying is that if you read the Bible, the Bible's going to tell you heaven doesn't exist. He's going to tell you this idea that you'll die and go to heaven. He says that's nowhere in scripture. Nowhere. He says what Jesus was talking about was a world here and now where we all just learn to get along. I mean, come on, guys. Why are we, why are we going to be all so upset with one another? Can't we just have peace? Um, the assumption is that the church is lying to you, that they are telling you that there's a fantasy world, out, uh, world where if you make the right choice, you get in. The truth is that everyone should do whatever they want and be whoever they want, and God loves you for it. So the reality of number four and number five is both Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father except through him. The prodigal son believes that he can make his own way. He believes he can find his own life. It is only when he finds that his life sucks... Uh, that he comes crawling back begging. Think about this. The son, this prodigal son, that's why I brought up this text for Dr. Steve and the secret Christians, is they said, we don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. We're going to go do our own thing, be our own person, be whoever we want to be. When they come back riddled with disease, broke with nothing to offer, it's only then that the prodigal son realizes that the truth was where his father was all along. He was running from it. And so Dr. Steve says, oh, you know, like heaven, this heaven is not a real place. What's interesting is he starts quoting some scripture, which I didn't put on here. It's blasphemy. But um, he started quoting some scripture where it talks about like heaven, like heaven, right? If you read Revelation chapter 19, it tells you that there will be a, a new heaven and a new earth. 
Okay, so the idea is that, like, I w we're not getting into Revelation here tonight. That's a whole other thing. But the idea is that this will all pass away. You will die. Like, um, Jesus talks about wool, uh, woods, wood, hay, and stubble, right? Um, Jesus says, don't worry about those who can kill the body. Worry about those who can kill the soul. Jesus wants you to not focus on the temporary things. He wants you to focus on eternal things. He says, store for yourself up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not decay. So Jesus is saying, look towards this eternal world. When Pilate says, don't you know that I have the authority to crucify you right here, that life and death are in my hand? Jesus responded to Pilate and said, if my kingdom were of this world, do you think my followers would have handed me to you? Core to the narrative of the Bible, core to the narrative of Scripture, is the teachings of heaven. Um, I don't know what Dr. Steve is getting off on, but there is... There is literally no viable proof to anything he is saying. He's just saying stuff. This is what I want to warn you guys about. This is what the series is all about. He has a doctorate. There are smart people out there in the world who have these credentials that will tell you something because it sounds good. I, I heard a guy, again, the same two atheists who are arguing about, you know, sports. Um, sports. Um, and uh, one of them said, like, yeah, there's, you know, sport. He was, he was talking about things. And he, he's like, there's sports for women, like gymnastics and stuff like that, and, and how they're developed for women, and men control the world and all this kind of stuff. The other guy says, like, well, no, you're wrong. There's the WNBA. There's, like, these kind of things. And he basically destroys all the guy's points. And the guy then goes on record and says, well, hold on. He's like, I'm just figuring this out. Like, we're having a conversation. He's like, I don't really know. Because what had happened is his whole argument had just gotten crippled. And he was like, oh, well, I don't really know. So let me get this straight. For the last hour, you spoke authoritatively on something you had no business speaking on. Is that what you just said? There are people out there in the world who will start saying things that sound good. And because you don't know enough, because you haven't studied enough, because no one has, has a, a right to say, let me get back to you on that. Because no one's willing to have conversations anymore because you're harshing their truth. You're attacking their truth. Whoa, you're condemning me for my beliefs? Easy. Because nobody wants to have conversations anymore, because no one's caring about what the truth is, people like him can get up there, write something with a doctorate to their name that has no basis in value. Like, I, there was, a, there was a, a, a book a guy sent to me. He's like, did you know your whole Christian religion's a sham? And I was like, no, tell me more. And uh, I, I never shut anyone down. I'm like, yeah, like, I opened the door. Like, let me hear it all. And he's like, there's this book here. And he starts going on uh, Josephus and Caesar, and Caesar and all this kind of stuff. And instead of answering him, I turned him to one of my high school students. I was like, his name was Jake at the time. I was like, Jake, you want to take this one? Jake's like, I got this one. Like, and he just started to be like, no, okay, first of all, like, your timeline on the flood is way off by centuries. Like, he just started, like, ripping this adult to shreds. What happened to this adult? He picked up a book. It sounded good. He then shaped his whole life around this book. And then a high school student just destroys him he cared enough to know that's what we're talking about guys the sent home the nugget of truth here today is that jesus established the church the world will seek to tear it down but the gates of hell will not overcome it matthew 16 18 jesus said and i also say to you that you are peter and on this rock i will build my church and the gates of hell will not overpower it there are many people out there who to this day are like we don't need church we can find our own god um, they're, they're not going to church. They're, and this is what I want to speak against specifically today. There's people who, who are just anti-intellectual when it comes to the Bible. They're, they're, they're picking whatever they want to listen to. They're, they're not getting involved with the church. They're not getting involved with the community of believers. They're not challenging themselves to know anything other than what they want to know. Um, they're living off of people who just preach the same thing nonstop. Like, Jesus loves you. Feel good. All that kind of stuff. Um, I want to I invite up Dean and Ashley uh, to get ready here. We're going to sing a song. Um, but guys, when the son ran from the father, he rejected everything the father was. And he only wanted what the father could give him. And that's what people are doing today with Christianity. We don't care who God is. We don't care who Jesus is. We don't care about what the Bible says. We want to make up our own religion that sounds good. And so we're going to turn Jesus into whoever we want to turn him into. And they ignore the doctrine of the church. They ignore everything that we've built. Now, if there's bad doctrine, we've got to tear it down. I support 
I wholeheartedly support Martin Luther and his 95 Theses, okay? Um, but what we have, we're going to sing a song here called The Creed, okay? I want to invite you guys. I'm going to do something weird. A lot of times you go to youth groups and people are like, sing. Okay, no, like, you don't have to sing. Like, you don't have to sing along. Um, we're going to sing our creed. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in God in three in one. Um, if you don't believe these things, don't feel any shame. Do not, please do not sing along. But what I want tonight, what I want our song to be, what I want our prayer to God to be through worship, because we talked about worship, is if you believe these things, I invite you, even if you have a horrible, awful voice, to just go ahead, I'm kidding, just go ahead, uh, just go ahead and sing along. Pray these things. Because what this is, is this is a creed. We're going to state what we believe, that you believe in God the Father, that you believe in Christ the Son, that you believe in the Holy Spirit, that you believe God's three in one. You believe in the resurrection. You believe Jesus rose again. We're going to promote that we are not afraid of these things. We are not running from these things. We are strengthened in our belief around these things. And if you need help learning them, talk to me. I'll show you that there's proof. This is not an empty faith. These are not old things of a bygone era that need to be thrown away or rewritten. This is a faith that has withstood persecution. This is a faith that has withstood people trying to burn it to ashes, down to the ground so there's nothing left. This is a movement that transcends space and time because God is true, because God said so. So if I can invite everyone to stand up, please go ahead and sing with us this creed, what we believe in, if you believe it. Now is it on? Ooh. So my voice is a bit hoarse, so no judgment. <laughs> I'm Father everlasting, the all creating one. God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior, I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that he will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Judge and a defender, shepherd and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe in God. I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name.
saints communion and in your holy church i believe in the resurrection when jesus comes again for i believe in the name of jesus i believe in god our father i believe in christ our son i believe in the holy spirit our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Guys, when it comes to our doctrine, when it comes to our creed, we're not ashamed of it. We're not going to run from it. We're going to be united in it. I'm not afraid to say that Jesus rose again. I'm not afraid to say that this is his church. I'm not afraid to say that there's going to be a resurrection after death, that there is eternal life. And there is only one way to that life, that Jesus is that way, that truth, and that life. And whoever believes in him will come to the Father. We're not going to run from these things. That's why I love this song. At first, it's like you're, you're, you're singing your doctrine. Like, that's a weird thing. But no, it is who we are. It is what we are. We're not here to just make you feel good. There are parts of our religion that make us feel bad. There are parts of our religion that are hard to swallow. There are parts of our religion that we look at and we're like, ooh, that's a rough one because that asks something of me. But I'm not going to lie to you. We're not going to lie to our friends. We're not going to lie to people and say, oh, like, let's just kind of smooth this over. Let's make this more palatable. We're not here to give you a religious experience. We're not here to give you some sort of, some sort of like opiate, like fulfilled, like, whoa, like spiritual, man. We're here to talk about the truth, the way, and how we can back it up, how we can prove it, and that it costs us something, that it's not fun. When I led someone recently to Christ, there was a friend of mine who was on our time, he was at his wit's end. He, he showed to me, he's like, man, my life sucks. He's like, I need a change. And, I, and he's like, it is so hard. And I was like, thank you for coming to me. It's going to get a lot harder. <laughs> but your life is going to have meaning. It's going to have value because it's going to be true. That's what we're about. Let's pray. Thank you, God. <laughs>